Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and I hope you followed my advice to not eat anything that I wouldn't eat. Um, just a couple of announcements. I can't believe it's just a few weeks before Christmas, but we offer holiday gifts here. I can't believe it's time to start talking about this already. We ship beautiful gifts any place on the planet. We have gingerbread biscotti. We only make those biscotti between Thanksgiving and Christmas, so it's one time a year. They come in beautiful little gift tins. We can send them any place in the world. We have um, vegan cookie boxes. And then, of course, gift certificates for everything from membership to tuition to the Wellness Farm Institute. I've always said people don't need more stuff. They really need more experiences. And so I've stopped buying stuff for a lot of the people in my life and instead buy things that we can do together yoga classes or um, believe me I send my share of cookies all over the country too to people who are near and dear to me so anyway keep that in mind second thing is I have a big announcement and that is that our conference which is scheduled for November 10th through 12th next year uh, here in Columbus Ohio we've secured um, two speakers one back by popular demand and one who has never been here but I think you're going to be very interesting interested in hearing what he has to say so back by popular demand is the eminent psychiatrist Dr. Peter Bregan who's one of our business partners who will be talking about uh, therapy for many conditions that does not involve drugs. And um, joining him as a keynote speaker will be Peter Gerchke, who is the co-founder of Cochrane Collaboration, the most independent medical research organization on the planet. And so um, I call him the grandfather of informed medical decision making. He's the author of books like um, uh, Mammography, Truth, Lies, and Controversy, and Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime. He has a new book out about psychiatric drugs. He's very much on the same page as Dr. Bragan in terms of the uselessness and harm that comes from using those drugs. So anyway, mark your calendar. There will be more announcements of more speakers later, but that gives you an idea. We're going to have a fabulous conference in 2000. 17. Last but not least, it is time to register for winter semester, which starts in January. We have a full line of classes we'll be offering, the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course, 39 CMEs for docs, 39 CEs for nurses and dietitians, and lots of new uh, self-study online courses in children's health, cancer, men's health, um, behavior change, all kinds of things. So uh, if you're interested in any of that, you're going to want to email me at pampopper at msn.com and we will send you information or set up a time to talk to you or both, okay? All right, um, here is a great announcement. This was a presentation done at the American Heart Association Conference recently. Um, genes are not the primary cause of heart disease, according to this presentation. Diet and lifestyle habits are. This is not the kind of thing that is usually talked about at the American Heart Association Conference. It's so much about the drugs and surgeries and that sort of thing. Well, to come up with this data, researchers looked at data for 55,685 patients who were included in four studies. They looked at 50 genes related to heart disease risk, and then they placed the subjects in five different categories based on the number of risky genes they had. They also sorted the patients into three groups based on lifestyle factors, which included not being obese with a BMI less than 30, exercising at least once a week, and healthy, um, eating a healthy diet and not smoking. Now, the healthy diet wasn't stellar, but here's what it was. It was defined as eating more fruit, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, fish, and dairy, and less refined grains, processed meats, red meat, sugar-sweetened beverages, trans fats, and sodium. Now, patients in the top quintile for genes, those who had the most risky genes, had twice as many events as those in the bottom quintile. But practicing at least three healthy habits, the ones that I just listed, resulted in a risk reduction of 50% for those in the highest risk genetic group when compared to those who only practiced one healthy habit or no healthy habits. While the risk reduction was highest in the riskiest group, the researchers said that everybody would benefit from doing, uh, from practicing healthy habits. In fact, what they found is individuals with good genetic profiles completely eradicated their advantage if they practiced unhealthy habits. So people who started with bad genes made their lot better, and people who started with good genes completely wiped out any advantage they had by doing bad things on a daily basis. 
And researchers wrote, patients may equate DNA-based risk estimates with determinism, a perceived lack of control over the ability to improve outcomes. However, our results provide evidence that lifestyle factors may powerfully modify risk regardless of the patient's genetic profile. According to the lead researcher, he said, DNA is not destiny and you have control. Many people assume that if your father had a heart attack, you're destined to have a problem too, but the results show that this is not the case. It's your diet and lifestyle habits, people, it's not your genes. Now, it's important to note, I said this earlier, that the healthy lifestyle habits were not all that healthy, yet they still resulted in significant risk reduction. The criteria for eating a better diet really wasn't very stringent. Exercise once a week or more, that's really not very much. And the BMI upper limit of 30 meant that um, there were lots of overweight people who certainly weren't very healthy, included in the list of people who practiced healthy habits. Now let's think about Dr. Esselstyn's research. He showed that a low-fat plant-based diet could stop the progression of and even reverse uh, coronary artery disease in people. And so based on that, we can assume that if this had been done a little bit differently and the people who had the risky genetic profile or all of these people had been practicing Dr. Esselstyn's diet, um, the risk reduction would have been ratcheted down to almost zero. There wouldn't have been any risk at all. And in fact, Dr. Esselstyn says, and this is his quote, I took it right off his website. If the truth be known, coronary artery disease is a toothless paper tiger that need never ever exist. And if it does exist, it need never ever progress. And this is regardless of your genes. All right, so you can't blame your health on your genes. Second topic for today. According to an article written by Ira Goodman, a medical doctor, an inability to read and interpret medical research is rampant in medicine today. This incompetence is exploited by the drug companies, he says, who have cluttered medical journals with what Goodman calls, quote, statistical noise meant to confuse and influence doctors into believing what the drug companies want them to believe. Goodman says that this is the only way you can possibly explain how the community standard of care for treating high cholesterol is a class of drugs that works less than 1% of the time. We're talking about statin drugs like Lipitor, Crestor, that whole category. Goodman goes on to say that because most physicians do not understand statistics, they're easy to convince with inaccurate information. They often reach the wrong conclusions as a result of reading journal articles, and this often leads to poor treatment recommendations. In addition to statin drugs, other examples of questions questionable but standard medical practices include the prescribing of aspirin, thyroid medication in many if not most circumstances, and several cardiac procedures which have never been subjected to randomized controlled trials. Goodman's depressing analysis is consistent with surveys and other published research. For most doctors, the leading source of information about how to treat patients is drug reps. And the most commonly reason cited for relying on drug reps for information, doctors actually say that it saves me from having to do my own research. When doctors do their own research, you'd like to think that things are better, but not so much. The most commonly cited uh, source of information for how to treat patients, over 50% of doctors say it's Wikipedia. And that's their first choice of where to find information about how to treat patients. Um, doctors report their other favorite sources of information are YouTube videos posted on drug company websites. Um, and that's really not much better than <laughs> Wikipedia. I mean, I have, you almost have to laugh because if you don't, you're going to cry. Goodman also takes aim at the system that facilitates this very sad state of affairs. Evidence-based medicine is supposed to result in better care, but the reality is that outcomes have not improved since quote-unquote evidence-based medicine has replaced clinical judgment. This is true. The attempt to distill medicine into some type of um, user manual for human beings, that's sort of what it looks like to me, some type of operations manual, everything operates the same. You know, it hasn't improved the delivery of medicine, and it's one of the reasons why people are over-tested, over-diagnosed, over-medicated, and subjected to too many procedures. Now, some people benefit from testing and treatment, but one size does not fit all. And the attempt to standardize everything as if we were some type of machine that you could write an operations manual for has, it, has resulted in less, well, worse outcomes, but also less patient satisfaction. I've had people tell me that they feel like they're on an assembly line in a factory, particularly since appointments time, appointment times are really, really short, and uh, many doctors don't have either the time or even the inclination to engage in any discussions about this stuff. 
Perhaps one of the best things about Goodman's article is that while pointing out the lack of judgment for doctors, he provides an excellent lesson in statistics for the average consumer. For example, he cites a study showing that Lipitor reduced events by 28% over a four-year period. But, and this is a common thing drug companies do, they report the data in relative rather than absolute terms. The real risk reduction is only 3%, which means that the number needed to treat, how many people have to take this drug to benefit, 30 patients for one person to benefit. But Goodman points out the number needed to harm NNH is one. Everybody is harmed in some way by taking Lipitor. All drugs have side effects. The numbers for primary prevention are even worse. 300 people have to take Lipitor to prevent one event, but again, number needed to harm, just one. Everybody who takes the drug experiences some harm. Goodman rightly points out that in the average doctor's office, discussions involving these numbers rarely take place. Doctors tell patients to take Lipitor. We refer to that as uh, informing the patient, stating that the drug will reduce the risk of heart attack by 30%, which is not true. And then the patient dutifully complies and takes the drug, which we call consenting. That is not informed consent. That is not what it's about. Goodman says that the right way to present Lipitor for patients for primary prevention is to tell the patient that he has a 1 in 300 chance of benefiting from taking Lipitor and a 100% chance of being harmed. While this is an accurate statement, the problem is obvious. No doctor who understands this would even propose Lipitor. And additionally, it is bad for business. That's why what we do here at Wellness Form Health cannot be done in a medical institution. It dries up demand for very profitable practices and procedures. Well, here's what I've been saying for years. Today's medicine involves the collision of low expectations and little knowledge in a doctor's office. A patient doesn't know much about his health or the options for regaining and maintaining health. Unfortunately, the doctor has little knowledge of what, what we're talking about here um, in terms of benefits and risks of treatments, and the doctor doesn't have much knowledge about how to help patients achieve and maintain optimal health either. And this messy situation is why the outcomes are so terrible today. Well, I don't think it's likely that the medical system is going to change anytime soon. There is just way too much money in it. So we're just going to have to do this one person at a time. I expect you guys to go out and spread the message. If enough people know about this, we will reach that point. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the tipping point where there are so many people on board with this message that we will dry up demand for the stuff that needs to go away in medicine. We'll force the system to comply. Please help me do that. That's really my goal here. Spread the word. So I'll close the way I always do. Well, with, I'm, I'm adding something. You guys always ask me for the references, and they are all included in the articles posted in the Health Breaks Library. So that's how you get access to the articles and references. Pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.